Welcome, everyone. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Nikki Lefebvre. I'm the executive director of the Natick Historical Society. Uh, we were established in 1870, and today we remain an independent nonprofit that receives no public funds. Uh, we really thrive on the support of our community members, um, like so many of you. And so I want to express my deep appreciation for uh, those contributions that make programs like these possible. Thank you so much. Um, we're delighted to have with us tonight, James Hearson, President and Executive Director of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And while I will formally introduce him in a moment, I want to note first that this program is one uh, uh, part of our Meet Our Neighbors series, which seeks to shine a light on local organizations that really have shaped uh, so much of Natick's sort of past, present, um, and, and, and will continue to shape Natick into the future. Um, this is the third and final event in our spring run of, of Meet Our Neighbors. And um, I do wanna highlight a couple of other upcoming events that we have at the Natick Historical Society. Next Wednesday, June 1st, we've partnered with the Bacon Free Library to host Swati Dave, who will present A Culture Marker, the story of Kolam and Natick Center. And uh, that program will be on Zoom at 7 p.m. You can register for that on our website. And as a companion piece, we'll also be holding a, um, in partnership with the Bacon Free Library, uh, a, an all ages workshop to create your own column. Um, and that will be held in Shaw Park, just across the street from the Natick Historical Society and Bacon Free Library on Saturday, June 11th at 2 p.m. Uh, and you can register for that event on our website as well. And I'm happy to share that this summer we'll also be hosting uh, in-person talks featuring Gail Coughlin, our very own research manager, um, who will be presenting on Natick during King Philip's War. Um, these in-person talks will also take place at Shaw Park uh, just across the street uh, from the library and museum in South Natick. Um, although Gail's first talk in June is full, you can book ahead and register for her talks on, June, on July 9th and August 6th, um, both at 10 a.m. on Saturday, Saturday mornings. Um, you can register for those programs on our website. Um, and finally, I'll note that at the end of the month, on Sunday, June 26th, we will be co-hosting uh, along with Natick for Black Lives Matter, a community reading of Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, uh, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. And uh, we'll be recruiting teens and some community leaders uh, to participate in that read. And we'll hope that you come down to join us on the front steps of the Morse Institute Library. Um, and that program uh, will be funded by the Mass Humanities Initiative for a More Perfect Union. Um, you can learn more about all of these programs on our website, nativehistoricalsociety.org. So without further ado, I'm very happy to have with us tonight, um, James Hearson, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. He was the executive director of the St. Andrew's Botanic Garden in Scotland from 2014 to 2019. With a core focus on horticultural excellence, he was responsible for developing all aspects of the organization's guest experience, outreach, and educational programs. He brought new ideas to St. Andrews and helped the organization reach new audiences. Prior to St. Andrews, Hearson was curator at the Royal Botanic Garden of Jordan, a member of the Chartered Institute of, uh, of Horticulturalists. Hearson began his career in the UK as a working gardener and nursery manager before attending Riddle College for his undergraduate degree in horticulture and the University of Cambridge for his practical horticulture and plantsmanship. He was also a participant in the Longwood Graduate Program in Public Horticulture in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Pearson brings extensive horticultural experience and high energy leadership to the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. Uh, and we're delighted you do, James. Thank you and thanks for joining us here tonight. James, I'll turn it over to you with a warm but silent Zoom round of applause. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nikki. I appreciate that um, introduction very much. Thanks for the opportunity to, to um, speak with you this evening. Um, I apologize for the slightly unusual background. I'm actually um, in the UK. It's midnight here tonight, and um, I'm uh, here for the RHS um, Royal Horticultural Society Chelsea Flower Show, um, also visiting a couple of gardens, um, but I actually got the chance to see my family too today. So. 
um, I'm camping out at my sister's house. So um, uh, that, that also, if, if I look left um, a lot during this uh, during this talk, uh, I apologize. I'm also not on my normal setup, so all my notes are sort of far away to my left, um, and I know that my camera is is straight in front of me. So um, uh, I just apologize for that practically. So I'm going to try and carry cover quite a lot of ground this evening. Um, I really want to do three things. The first is just give a um, very brief historical introduction to Massachusetts Horticultural Society as a society. Um, and I'll do that the, the quickest of all of these. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the um, Elm Bank garden and uh, properties um, that you'll be familiar with, I'm sure. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our current programs and what we're trying to do, particularly in the area of restoration and some of the opportunities that are available to us currently. So Massachusetts Horticultural Society first. Um, the Horticultural Society um, was established in 1829. Um, we are not the first ever horticultural society in America. The Pennsylvania Horticultural Society started meeting in 1827. Uh, they just pipped us to the post uh, by a couple of years, but they didn't actually incorporate. They were just a, a group of friends um, and they didn't incorporate until 1831. And so when we met in 1829, we immediately incorporated. Um, so we do um, we do say that we are the oldest incorporated or the oldest established horticultural society that has been continuously operating um, in the US um, since 1829. And so um, that happened, it, it was done by a lot of the um, leading figures in Boston um, at that time. Um, some names will be known to you, Thaddeus Harris, Henry Dearborn, um, Jacob Bigelow, uh, notable among them. And um, immediately a library was established. Um, a series of prizes was established for horticultural um, breakthroughs um, and for specimens and educational programs, um, really right there in the first year. And, um, and then very quickly, a large property, a large piece of land was bought um, within the first few years. Um, that land becoming the Mount Auburn Cemetery. So at its foundation, very, very active, um, the Horticultural Society in 1829 through the 1830s. Um, very quickly, the Society um, built a, a headquarters in downtown Boston um, on School Street. And in that early phase, a lot of the focus of its work would have been on um, productive crops that were suitable for New England. And so a lot of time would be spent um, on uh gentlemen farmers and and farmers well farmers of all kinds but particularly the gentlemen farmers those with land and wealth um would spend a lot of time um bringing productive crops um in so fruit and vegetables particularly um trialing them seeing um what worked best in new england um crossing them breeding them developing new um new strains um including in 1853 um the concord grape which um, we all know that was a new introduction um, pioneered by members of the society and so um, that sort of took them through the, the uh, first 20, 30 years of the society, um, built a second horticultural hall um, in 1864. And on the horticultural hall, this is a little intersection with Elm Bank, on the um, horticultural hall, the second one in 1864, they commissioned three statues of horticultural goddesses, Ceres, Pomona, and Flora. And those three marble statues were placed on the front um, pinnacle of the hall. And um, when the and they were presented to the society by one gentleman, well, three gentlemen, but one of those gentlemen was Benjamin Cheney. And we'll come back to Benjamin Cheney when we talk about Elm Bank later. So um, Benjamin Cheney was one of three key figure in the society, uh, presented these statues to the society and they were installed on the um, on the building. And uh, the reason that's relevant, we'll come back to Benjamin Cheney, but also if you visit the garden now, you'll see uh, on the Maple Lawn, the Maple Grove, right in the heart of the garden, there are three statues. And those are the three statues from that building. They were lost. Um, we don't know when they were lost, but they were found um, in the 1990s. They were found um, buried up to their necks um, in mud and uh, in a mire, really, um, on an estate on the North Shore. And they were recovered and brought back um, to Elm Bank, and they now stand in the heart of the garden as, a, as an interesting and important historical um, feature. So soon after that, um, 1871, the New England Flower Show um, was established, the New England Spring Flower Show. That ran fairly continuously through to 2008, uh, missed a year in 2009, um, continued then until 2020. 
And 2020 was the last um, Boston, Fl what is now Boston Flower Show, but was New England Spring Flower Show. Um, and so that has been a long, continuously running important um, show uh, in North America over that period of time. The Horticultural Society has been a pioneer in a lot of other things as well. It really was one of the pioneers in school gardening. Um, as early as the 1870s, we have um, school educational program. Um, and um, throughout the next 100 years, really, um, schools and educational programs have been a, a real focus. Um, in 1900, um, the Massachusetts Horticultural Hall um, was built. That's the um, beautiful property um, that you'll be familiar with, I'm sure, on the corner of um, Huntington Avenue and Massachusetts Avenue in downtown Boston, opposite the Symphony Hall. And um, that was built in 1900, and we occupied that um, until 1990, I believe. My, my, my final date there might be a bit wrong, but about that, that period. We were in the Horticultural Hall, the third Horticultural Hall there in downtown. And it didn't just host us, it hosted um, a number of organizations, some of which we um, provided space for, uh, but some of which we had a, uh, an important part in founding and establishing and supporting as new organizations. So examples of those um, are uh, the New England Wildflower Society, now the Native Plant Trust. Um, that was founded by um, a group of members of the uh, Massachusetts Horticultural Society um, and was hosted in, um, downtown in, in the building that we we owned there. But others too, um, and I'll read you a list of others, um, the Benevolent Fraternity of Fruit and, Fruit and Flower Mission, the Wildflower Society we've mentioned, the Garden Club Federation um, was hosted downtown, the Boston Mycological Club, the New England Gourd Society, the New England Gladiolus Society, and the Herb Society of America, which actually also had its headquarters nationally here um, under the sponsorship and support of Massachusetts Horticultural Society. So over many years, it's, it's had a fairly significant role um, in Massachusetts and actually, in fact, um, on a national basis. So uh, in the 1990s, um, 1992, the, the hall was sold. Um, and in 1996, um, we signed a lease with Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, what was the, then the MDC, um, for the Elm Bank site. So we lease 36 acres, um, really being the center area of the Elm Bank Reservation um, from uh, Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And we hold that on a 99 year lease um, starting from 1996. And so we, we officially moved in 2001, we did minor renovations um, to the buildings, but not the, the big house, not the manor house. Um, and we occupy those. We have our library, we have um, educational programs, we have offices, um, we have significant horticultural programs there. And then over really the, the 10 years from 2001 to 2011 in particular, started to work on restoring garden areas, starting with the Italianate garden and installing new garden areas. And so that's, that's really just a, a little background to Massachusetts Horticultural Society. Um, and our move really from downtown Boston um, in 2001 out to Elm Bank and to um, the estate here. And so um, we have um, had a, a mission to uh, educate and inform and um, support horticulture, the art and science of horticulture in Massachusetts, dating back to 1829. And um, I do want to mention that over the past two years, so I've been uh, president and executive director now since January 2020. Um, that was not a brilliant time to be starting leadership of a new organization um, in some ways. Uh, certainly been some challenges and some, some difficulties since then. However, um, this past two years has forced us to really look at what is core to our mission and what it is that we really want to be for and how we really do help people. And so we um, have taken our history and really looked into it and really thought about it and thought about how we can articulate what that means today and how that, that is relevant today. And so we do have a, um, uh, a new way of expressing this that um, we use and is, is important to us. And we say that Massachusetts Horticultural Society advances individual community and planetary flourishing by inspiring, teaching and facilitating people to grow plants together. And um, really that that can be summarized down a little bit further to growing plants together and what we mean by that is that people we believe live better healthier happier lives 
um, when they um, understand how to and have opportunity to grow plants and when they do that in communities, not on their own, but, but together. And whether it's for um, therapeutic purposes, for health purposes, for fitness, whether it's for just beautification, whether it's to make our cities more livable um, through tree canopy cover, through heat effect, through um, dealing with urban blight, or whether it's through for um, just straight up pleasure of, of, of gardening and, and understanding and spending time in nature. Um, we think that people's lives are improved um, through horticulture and that, that plants really are going to play a really important role in terms of um, the future of the planet and the way we're going to live on the planet in, in coming years and coming generations. And so we've tried to articulate this mission down um, to here. So this is us. This is who we are and, and what we're trying to do. And we're occupying um, this, this site that has an equally important and an even longer history than we have. And so the Elm Bank site, I'm certain that everyone here uh, has a basic familiarity with it um, at, at least some level and uh, will know um, something of it. But this is a, a picture of not the current property, but the, um, the earlier property that was there. And uh, I'll just run through um, a few of the details of the, the history. So let's just pull up a little timeline here. Uh, we'll start at the beginning because I find that's easier when doing history. Um, so we're looking here or, or we're looking here at a timeline. So um, we've got multiple documents that say, and this is this is an interesting point and it's something that we need further information on. And I'll just put out there right at the beginning, um, looking at the history of Elm Bank, as we have opportunity to undertake some restoration projects, one of the things we're looking for currently is people who are interested in and willing to do research with us. We have a very good archive, but it's relating to the Horticultural Society. Um, and actually the best archive historically for Elm Bank is actually held by yourselves. Um, I have copies of photos that you supplied in um, 1999 when we were doing site review. Um, and actually most of our best historical photos actually do come from Nadic um, Historical Society. And so one of the things we'd love to do is, is look at whether they could be digitized, whether they could be made more available and, and how we could work together on that. So we're, we're fairly limited. But one of the things that comes up several times in several places is that um, the site was first occupied by um, the Native American group, um, the Nahanton. Now, when I look at all the people groups in Massachusetts, I don't actually see much on this, this particular group. It's part of the Algonquin language group. Um, and we know that... Um, they live peacefully in coexistence with um, the uh, European settlers um, in the 1720s, 1740s. There are several references um, up to this period and during this period up to Colonel John Jones Jr., um, who was the first um, purchaser of land um, and that, that there was this overlap in terms of um, the occupation and the use and the settlement on the land. So the, the area we're talking about, the Elmbank, what is now the Elm Bank Reservation is um, variously described as between 182 and 188 acres. The reason for that is that there's six acres of very, very um, riverine um, swampland that, that sort of is it in or is it out? Um, is it land or is it river um, on, on the tip? So it's it's in bounded on three sides by the estuary. And the current configuration is roughly what it has been, this 180, 188 acres. Um, is roughly the area that's been over most of its history. Um, the Cheneys, and then um, we'll talk about Cheney and, and Boltzels, um, they did expand up as far as 240 acres at one point. So that would have probably taken it up um, all the way to the road through Buttercup, what's now Buttercup Lane and um, Turtle Lane, probably up to the road at one point. They owned all of that. But actually, historically, it really was this three-sided enclosed area that was treated as one, one parcel of land. And so we know that in 1740, Colonel John Jones um, was occupying it and that he planted um, elm trees. And there were five particularly magnificent elm trees um, that were around the farmhouse. And this is this is I'm su this is somewhat surprising. It would seem to me that probably he didn't plant the first elm trees. Again, uh, the history we have and I'm drawing quite a lot on a, a really wonderful um, article by um, Alison Hayward, um, that was written for the Garden History Society of New England, which actually was an organization that we um, founded, managed, but now has, has, um, has wound up. Um, she wrote a, a fantastic article for that um, peer-reviewed journal um, in, 
2000, in the year 2000, that's Alison Haywood. So this is a lot of my source material, a lot of what we know really um, is the result of her research. And so um, Colonel John Jones occupied it in 1740. Um, and then it passed through um, really four owners after him, um, sort of in, in fairly quick succession. And the use of the land was as farmland. It was, um, I, I've got details here. We had 102 acres. The Jones Farmstead had 102 acres of land with livestock, horses, cattle, and sheep, 25 acres of pasture, smaller parcels used for hay production. Six acres were under cultivation. I think that means vegetable um, cultivation, specifically intensive cultivation, as opposed to the um, the hay and the, the other kind of pasture. Um, so he owned the property for 64 years and he um, was particularly known for the elm trees. Um, it transferred in 1868 to Theodore Otis, a mayor of Roxbury. And um, at that point, it transitioned a little bit into a seasonal retreat. So it went from really being productive to more gentlemen farmers, what would have been called gentlemen farmers. Um, and he also built greenhouses on the property, significant greenhouses. And then in 1873, it was purchased at auction, but auction, or, sorry, it was purchased at auction um, by Benjamin Cheney. Now, Benjamin Cheney was interesting. He was a incredibly successful businessman, um, but he had actually made his start as a um, as a coach driver, um, and so he um, was driving st stagecoaches, and he was known as being particularly trustworthy. And so businessmen would um, give to him high value items to transport uh, in a way they wouldn't to others. And he eventually founded his own company um, called the Cheney, Cheney and Company Express. Um, and that got larger and it got built up. Eventually, he was running express lines uh, from New England to Montreal uh, into Canada. It became known as the United States and Canada Express Company. It merged with other companies and eventually became known as the American Express Company which is American Express. And so um, that's the source of the wealth um, that, that eventually led to, to um, the, the manor house at Elm Bank. And so in the 1870s, about 1874, 75, um, he built and started to transform this estate um, by building, uh, let me go on to my next slide, so I'm getting behind myself, um, by building this Queen Anne Victorian style uh, mansion. It was designed by John Fox. Um, he was a prominent architect from Dorchester. He had built many, many buildings in Dorchester, particularly early in his career. And then after he became better known, um, really around Massachusetts into Rhode Island, um, included um, several city halls um, in, in Rhode Island, particularly, and um, was a, a very well-known and successful um, architect. Um, and he cited the mansion um, really in the midst of those five elms. And there's a really good um, image there that gives you the impression of that, not on the site of the current mansion, but um, just further along the ridge line um, in the heart of those elms. And when the new mansion was built, it was the location was changed really to protect um, the elms that were there um, and, and, and not to have to take those down. I apologize, I'm, I'm losing my voice a little bit. So this was the, um, this was the original um, property, uh, or at least the original big um, country retreat property that was um, that really had this large amount of wealth put into it. And um, interestingly, although this area was known at that time for, se for seasonal retreats, for summer retreats, this was um, a more year round type of um, estate. And that became much more so with the building of the, the second mansion. And then um, we move on and um, various changes. In 1895, Benjamin Cheney died. Um, his widow um, and son managed the property, and they that's the era at which they purchased other property to take the estate right up to 235 acres. That was the biggest point at which this was uh, a contiguous estate. And um, this, the, the wooden-built um, property, was then replaced with the mansion um, or manor house, as it was called. Uh, we tend to call it a mansion just because we can't really imagine it being anything else, but it really was known as the manor house um originally and so this was built um um in 1908 um so the architect for this um let me just go on one page and give you another view there you are. so 1908 the existing manager was cited designed by carrera and hastings 
um, very well-known, famous um, architects. They also built the New York Public Library um, and um, house office buildings in Washington, D.C., so very significant architecture. Um, he also um, built the carriage house. Um, I should have noted before, the um, the two there's two um, residential properties still on the estate. The What was this, the superintendent's house and then the gardener's cottage. Um, I actually live in the gardener's cottage. It's it's right on the very front of the parking lot as you go into the entrance to the garden today. And the superintendent's house, which is just marginally bigger, not enough to notice, but just enough to make sure that you knew the superintendent was the boss and not the gardener. Um, that's around the back as you go further around the, the current day loop. And so um, what was then added on, obviously, with the house was built. Um, later on, the boathouse was built down by the canal and the canal and then in 1920, the carriage house. So um, you'll see on the slide, you have the carriage house that's currently um, used as our wedding venue. Um, it's interesting to see that it was actually open when it was original. Now we have wooden doors in that, but that was an open um, carriage house. Given that it was 1920, um, although we call it the carriage house, um, uh, I'm pretty sure that that was always designed for automobiles and never, never designed for what we would think of as being carriages in the, the sense of being horse-drawn. So um, this is a, a beautiful view of that at that point. And um, obviously important to us particularly is then that the gardens were extensively designed and laid out. I'll just say a little bit thing, a couple of things about the um, the inside of the manor house um, while I'm here. So um, I don't know if many of you have had the opportunity to be in uh, inside the manor house. The, the heating has not been on since 1989 um, and the interior on the ground floor is relatively intact, but on the upper floors is, is pretty much completely devastated in terms of the plaster and, and other things. It's had no heat for, what is that, 30 something years at this point. And so um, it's quite interesting. It has a, a library that is um, uh, wood paneled, still in reasonably sh good shape as far as we can tell. Um, that was modeled on Sir Walter Scott's um, library directly, apparently and um, beautiful flooring, marble flooring, and um, beautiful fireplaces, marble fireplaces all the way through the building. And um, what I've been told, although this is hard to corroborate exactly, but what, what, what I've been told and, and from different sources is that um, during their honeymoon, they went on what they, as they would have done, they went on a grand tour of Europe and particularly Italy, and that in each separate major city they were in whether it's Verona or um you know um, Padua or all the different places they went in each Italian city they commissioned a, a different fireplace and then they were sent back now I can't corroborate that entirely but we do know that we have incredibly different designs and styles and types of marble um, in each room we have a beautiful marble fireplace in each room downstairs and in fact some of the upstairs rooms as well and they're incredibly different and and clearly done without a huge amount of reference to the other fireplaces, it seems. And so there's some interesting historical um, elements like that um, in the property. So the um, the upper two floors, um, very much, you know, the plaster work and other things, beautiful, completely intact um, cedar closets, walk-in cedar closets upstairs on the third floor. Um, and otherwise, um, and then the basement, um, completely inaccessible, um, has extremely dangerous asbestos problems. We're not allowed in it under any circumstances. No one, no one can go into the basement at all. And so that's that's the current condition of the the manor house. It is structurally stable. It is sound, and it is um, it is basically watertight. Um, I'll come to that um, at the end, and I'll talk about um, steps that need to be taken imminently in order to make sure that that remains the case. So that's the manor house. But at the same time as doing the manor house, obviously they wanted to lay out the estate and the gardens. And so um, they did, starting with the Italianate garden, which you can see on the slide here. Um, in the middle, you can see there is a temple. Now, that is the original temple that gave the name Temple Garden to the Temple Garden, um, but it never, ever went into the Temple Garden. And so that is a, um, a stone uh, structure with a base and stone um, columns supporting a steel um, roof. Um, and the base of that is still in the Italianate garden where it was placed. The stonework um, from the ground up is missing, um, as is the steelwork. And what is currently in its place is just a steel frame um, temple um, in, in its place. So that was in the Italianate garden 
um, very much a formal garden. It would not have had bedding plants in as we currently have it. It would have been very much grass, um, clipped cedars um, and, and structural elements um, primarily. Going on from there, um, ah, so here's the, here's the information on the Italian hate garden that would have been helpful for you to have. So that's a view of it from above um and designed in 19 or developed 1914 to 1927 by the Olmsted firm Olmsted brothers their lead designer um and the fountain which is currently in the center that's actually a baptismal font that was um created into a fountain from Spain 16th 1600s um Spanish and wrought iron gates um that they brought back from Italy too and then the temple garden um is what we currently call the Olms currently call the Olmsted garden and um, that is the garden that flows down on this picture. If you look at the formal garden in the middle of the slide, um, to the left and sort of towards the top on the diagonal towards the top left corner, um, there's a slope down to a kidney-shaped pond. That is um, that is the Olms what we call the Olmsted Garden. It's been variously called the Olmsted Garden, the Orient Oriental Garden, the Asian Garden, and the Temple Garden. So the Temple Garden, because the original design was for there to be a temple at the top of that, that was never put there. It was put into the Italianate garden. Um, the Asian garden really because it used a lot of Asian um, source plants that were quite novel at the time um, in the planting scheme. The Oriental garden, I think, because um, in the middle of the um, kidney-shaped pond, there is a Japanese cedar bridge, very much a model on a, or in fact, a direct copy of a famous bridge from Japan um, and, and very much modeled on that. And um, the Olmsted Garden, because it's just good to connect it with the designer, we find that helpful. So we'll have to um, settle on something um, that we just keep, keep we keep formal. So that that's that's the garden. Now this was obviously part of a much larger landscape. Um, there was um, bridleways and walkways and paths. There's the English woods, which if you're familiar with the site again, um, uh, from the the front loop, as you can see on this um, on this slide. Um, the front door of the manor house would have had a long uh, open lawn in front of it. And then at the end of that lawn, which are now soccer fields, and then at the end of those, there was what was called the English woods. And that part of that is still there. As you drive the loop, there's an area of trees on one section between where you drive and where the soccer fields are. Very open, very grassed landscape, but with beautiful specimen trees in it. That, that was the English wood, um, and that would have extended further in its current area. Um, obviously, the, the river would have been much more a prominent part of the landscape and the garden would have run right down to the river. And there's beautiful photos in the archives um, uh, that show the grass running right down to the river. So you could walk all the way around the estate um, on beautiful turf right down to the edge of the river. And so that that was um, a prominent part of the, the idea. So I'm going to move quickly because my time is going. Um, this is... Uh, the area of the landscape that we're particularly interested in. Um, this is a postcard looking down from the kidney-shaped lake up to where the temple should have been in the temple garden. And if we go on a stage, this is a photo of it um, past its peak, but certainly giving a sense of what it was like with a, a bridge over the lake. There's a weeping willow there in the background, lots of irises um, on the right, um, and water lilies um, in the in the pond. And this um, this is the this was a beautiful water garden. Um, unfortunately, this is its condition today. In fact, the condition of the bridge is significantly worse than that. There are only remnants now left actually in the water. And this is very much um, an area that's under invasive non-native plant dominance. This is a very derelict area. And so um, currently the Horticultural Society um, is initiating a project to um, undertake a restoration and repurposing of this area. And um, we have already started phase one of this. Um, you'll see on the right hand side of this slide, this is the actual original Olmsted Brothers landscape plan. Um, we have the original plans, we have the blueprint for the bridge, we have the planting list for some of the area of the garden, and we have actually a nursery list, an order, an order list of plants um, for part of this garden. And so the intention is to, um, to restore this, not like for like, this won't be a true restoration. Um, we're calling it a restoration repurposing. The intent is to restore the hard landscaping and the general in design intent. But we'll be looking plant by plant at the plant selection and thinking about what's appropriate for this um, ecology. This is in wetland. 
obviously wetland is is very sensitive and um, in Massachusetts in particular the rules around wetland are extremely um, strict as they as they should be and so we're working with Dover Conservation Commission to um, just do the permitting and and do what we need to do to to put in to put a proper garden back in um, but one that really is sensitive to the current ecological and environmental needs um, of this important wetland it's not only a wetland it's also directly connected to the Charles River so obviously there's huge sensitivity about that so we are um, currently in phase one of five phases of restoring this garden this will be primarily a garden project not a constructor project so it'll be primarily led by our horticulturists with volunteers with educational groups um, and initially it will just be a project to deal with um, invasive non-native weeds um, and we expect that to to really dominate the first year and then we'll continue to work on permitting and a design for the, the build phase and we're very fortunate that that has been supported by initial significant initial gift um, to support the first two years of work um, on this project it's just another couple of views of it um, just interesting little um, historical artifacts um, these these um, flagstones that form the path around that pond area were actually architectural salvage that was taken from the floor of Independence Hall um, in the early 19, about 1910, 1912. And um, when the floor was replaced, um, Olsa Brothers purchased those and brought them up and used them for this. So this would have been the flooring um, that, that Washington would have been inaugurated upon the second time, um, not in New York the first time, but in Philadelphia the second time. So really interesting little um, historical artifacts um, just find their way into gardens in, in quite surprising ways. So this is um, this is the um, initial plan for restoration of this area. Um, we're trying to develop a, a, the garden aesthetic as it was. We want to preserve the historic landscape. It's, it is on the 1987 it was added in 1987 to the um, National Historical Register or Register of Historical Places. Um, so it is recognized as an important um, historical um, landscape, specifically for the garden, um, actually. Um, and so we want to really work on conservation, working on um, natives and non-natives. But also, we really want to use this project as a model. We see that there's a huge amount of ecological reg restoration that needs to be done, a lot of work on the Charles River, a lot of work on the wider Elm Bank Reservation. And while we don't manage the reservation um, and we don't have the right at the moment to do anything else on the reservation, we would like to think that over time we might find a role on the Charles River Bank, um, although it's not within our lease that we might be able to work with DCR to develop that. So if we can develop this role, this, this area, and a, a team of volunteers to work with us, then that will help us to um, start thinking about um, going further. And so next steps, um, really, we have this project I've already mentioned, the Temple and Oriental Garden Restoration. Um, our focus currently is really on building volunteer work groups um, in horticulture and ecology, um, something that may be of particular interest to this group in re research and documentation. So making sure that we have all the images that are available, making sure that we digitize things that we do have, um, and trying to understand more about this landscape that we we want to develop um, and also supporting us in not so much direct funding. I don't mean um, uh, financially, I mean building support for these kind of projects among our community and amongst other groups. If you're interested in that, then um, go to our website and look for memberships. And, and the easiest way to be involved in all of our programs is to become a member of Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And then the second thing is the Manor House. Now the Manor House, um, um, Nikki, I'm I'm running a little long. Are you okay with me talk, taking about three or four minutes just to talk about where the Manor House is today? Great. So the Manor House is in an interesting situation. Um, it's 36,000 square foot um, plus the basement, which is full basement. So it's a huge, huge project. And um, sort of we, we've kind of got a number in the sky price of 20 to 40 million dollar to do the restoration. Um, for 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 something of this size, it's not it's not actually a ridiculous number. It's just that it's huge, and you can't divide it. You can't do ten percent and then do another ten percent. You have to just do it. Now um, we have over the past two years since I've been here, um, had a just very brief, very brief engineer review um, of the structure. We know that it's structurally sound. We know that it is capable of being restored. Um, 
we know that pretty much everything internally, all systems, all decorative finishes, all plaster work pretty much has to come out. Um, but that it is a viable, it is a it is possible to restore. Um, however, um, we are losing the window to do that restoration. And what I mean by that is that as soon as it loses water tightness, um, then within a couple of years, it would maybe even less, maybe even one winter, but certainly a couple of years, it would no longer be restorable. And so we have undertaken a couple of surveys of things like asbestos, um, of external woodwork, of we're looking at roof currently, just to establish exactly what it would take, not to restore it, because that is far outside our current capacity, but to ensure that we retain the ability to restore it for at least another 10 to 15 years. And so we believe that the cost of doing that is somewhere in the region of 800,000 to a million dollars. That would deal with um, uh, woodwork on windows, um, repainting all the windows, um, minor woodwork repairs around the eaves and around the roof line, minor minor repairs to the roof and critically removal of asbestos from the basement and the reason that's critical is that we have to be able to get into the basement in order to do maintenance around the soil line and there is some damage occurring around the soil line and so um, we're currently in a um, process of seeking state support and also we will be bringing that as a as a public campaign um, to raise those funds. We, we are in a position to put some money in, but nothing like the full amount. Um, we have to be very careful. Our mission is horticultural. Um, that is that is our charitable purpose. That's why we, we're here. But we also have a responsibility to do what we can in terms of the mansion and the, man, the manor house, and, um, and also to ensure that it's preserved for future generations. And so we'll very much be looking to partner with um, historical societies, with the state, with DCR, with anyone who really has an interest in it. Um, and so we do want to ensure that we preserve it um, or preserve it for at least another 10 or 15 years so that um, other opportunities might might arise in terms of the full restoration. And so um, that we have had some provisional success. Um, this is very current, and um, but it does seem that there might be some partial support from the state um, to, to do that initial phase of stabilizing the manor house so that at least we can restore it eventually so i, I knew that would be of interest and uh, i figured by addressing that now i'd probably answer a couple of the questions that i would get later anyway so um that's us um we're very um thrilled to be on that on the site and and have the property um under our care um, we recognize that it is a state property it's not ours and so we hold it in trust and um we're seeking to restore and to develop the historical aspects to fulfill our mission, but also to um, keep them and preserve them for future generations. So thank, thank you, Nikki. Well, thank you, James. Thank you so much. And I think um, um, on behalf of the group here, I'll offer you a, a warm but silent Zoom round of applause. Thanks so much. We, I have learned a lot and um, I want to encourage everyone here that if, if you haven't checked out uh, the Massachusetts Historical uh, excuse me, Massachusetts Horticultural Society's website, um, do so now. And if you haven't been to Elm Bank, then by all means, uh, make a trip. And uh, thank you, James.